It's time for Football at Four with Jeff Mosier. My personality is I, I want to win badly. I want to win more Lombardis for Philadelphia and our fans. we got the greatest fans around, and I will do everything possible. Powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios. This is Football at Four. All right, Football at Four is powered by the Inside the Birds podcast, and it is brought to you by PropSwap, America's sports betting marketplace. Sell your sports bets and take your profit. Find out how at PropSwap.com. Download the PropSwap app today. So the roster building part two, we had free agency, we had the draft. Now what? Where do these guys fit in? Jeff Mosher is here. We'll talk about that and some other things that some of our listeners have been posting in the chat throughout the show, on the text board as well. Jeff Mosher from the Inside the Birds podcast, which drops Thursday morning tomorrow at 6 a.m. with a freshie on the Eagles offseason. What's up, Mosher? I'm good, man. How are you? Always good, man. Uh, I get awesome. a lot of questions the last couple of days. So the Eagles didn't draft a corner other than McPherson in round four. They obviously don't have a corner starting caliber on the roster. Roseman suggested that, hey, we traded for a guy in 2017 in August. Um, do they go that route again, or is there an available corner? I keep getting asked. Steve Nelson, uh, R- R- Richard Sherman, Brashad Breland. Uh, there are a couple veteran corners. Do they bring one of those guys in, or is a trade more likely? Or do they? is there a diamond in the rough, uh, a Graylin Arnold or a Michael Jaquet that they like a lot more than all of us do? Well, I mean, they drafted a kid in the fourth round that they like a lot, and Zach McPherson. And certainly right now you look at it and say he's going to get a heck of an opportunity to be able to prove that, you know, he was drafted there for a reason and that they liked uh, some of his uh, – skill set that he's got do I do I still think Howie will wind up getting someone a little bit more accomplished between now and the start of the season sure um they're they're cash strapped now we all know that Casey Hayward just signed with the uh, Raiders I think a day ago guys like Steven Nelson and Richard Sherman older uh teams are waiting for the price to go down I'm sure but they're still going to sign for a price that the Eagles are going to have a tough time competing with unless they want to try to sign a guy give him a very very low base salary and then take that signing bonus and spread it out over so many years how many times has Howie already done that and it's great to say the cap goes up every year every year but if you're a number of players who are old and not so good that are guaranteed money year after year that's less money that you have to spend in any given year if you have to cut these guys and most likely anybody that you're signing right now you're not sure is going to be on the, the team in the next year or two so it's a difficult position they're in. I think once they get through the Zach Ertz hurdle and clear some money there, it might help them out a little bit. But I, still, I think they would rather be young than than old, and they would rather look for an opportunity for to trade for someone like a Ronald Darby that we've talked about who has some years of control and is cost-controlled at the time that you get him. And there's a bunch of new coaches. There's new schemes. That's what happened to Darby, right? It was He was in a scheme when Sean McDermott took over there that was different than – I think when uh, – who, who was the defensive coordinator for that? Was it Schwartz or was it Rex Ooh, Ryan? I don't Schwartz even remember. And Re- well, Rex – Schwartz was there. Then Rex Ryan became the head coach and took over. Right. So, uh, so so, I'm sure this scouting staff will be really good and diligent at looking for potential um, players who are decent at the position but may not fit the scheme anymore. Yeah, there's one other uh, – Garyon Conley is another guy who's a free agent. He was a first-round pick. Uh, yeah, a couple of years ago, he's been one of those guys who's had injury issues. He feels like an Eagles signing injury issues had potential. Get him in our system and we can get our hands on him. That that to me, Gary on Conley, for all the people listening and watching, sounds like the type of guy they would make a move on cheap. Prove it to me. Yeah, he might be too young, though. He's still only been in the league of 25. Years. I mean, yeah. If not, <laughs> yeah, if he was 29, I would say that exactly. But but there will be someone. I, I'm sure of it. Yeah, but you I, would I like would be... to I, – I, real quick, you, you would like to at least, though, see if McPherson can cl- claim this job. I mean, you would like to see – you're not going to have a first-round pick in a Pro Bowl or at every position. So you would like to see if this kid can compete and win that job out of camp. Right. That would be, I mean, I guess an ultimate win is if your fourth-round pick came in and he was 
the guy that you say, we've got to put him on the field. On the flip side, you might be saying, if we have to play our fourth-round pick, we might be in some trouble on that side of the field because, you know, um, he might not be ready to play every, you know, snap out there. You'd like to see that he can get on the field. But a lot of this is they don't really have a, a – an outside corner on the roster. They don't really even have a guy, Craig James. Uh, we, we don't know, you know, Mark, uh, Michael Jacquet, Graylin Arnold. I mean, there's a bevy of guys that I'm probably forgetting that I don't think any of us think are ready to be a starting outside corner in this league. Heck, uh, Kayvon Seymour was was doing uh, concrete pouring for three years <laughs> before they finally picked him up last year. Yeah, he's a he's a real Kurt Warner in the making, I'm sure. <laughs> right? <laughs> Stocking shelves. But um, no, I mean, you're right. And I think – and I know the Eagles have not released yet their list of uh, undrafted free agent signings. And some of the, the names that you reported uh, had seen, I don't think they've signed a corner. So the question is, well, why wouldn't you at least sign one on the, a corner? And the answer is, well, you've got five guys who pretty much qualify as undrafted rookie free agent type corners anyway whether it's Jaquette, Graylin Arnold, the guy uh, Kevon Seymour or uh, Shaquille Taylor who actually wasn't undrafted but you know is basically bouncing around here so it's not like they need a bunch of bodies they got bodies they need talented players so we'll see what happens correct Um, all right so uh, I want to get your thoughts on you guys talk to Greg Cosell uh, regularly and post draft here and kind of pick your brain on some of the things that stood out about the way the Eagles might use uh, Landon Dickerson here. Where do they see him? Uh, how does he factor into this season, if at all? I know how we should they anticipate him being ready. Uh, right. Is he? A, do they look at him as a center, a guard, as a uh, kind of depth guy all the way across the line? Because Nick Sirianni did indicate, yeah, he even played some tackle too, but we do view him as an inside guy. So what's something that – uh, Greg Cosell maybe says about where they think about this kid. Well, he does have tackle size at six six three twenty five, but not um, just not athletic enough on the outside to really. I'm sure he could play it in a pinch and hold his own. Uh, he almost has a Runyon esque type of skill set. So if he had to, you'd probably want to play him at right tackle instead of left. Although nowadays, you know the way they have pass rushers on each side being similar it's probably not that much of a difference but he's much better as a center or a guard I mean he'll eventually be a center the question is can he get on the field this year I don't think that they're going to and look as we sit here today anything's on the table right because they're in such a transition you know I think ideally they want to bring Isaac Sayomalu back at left guard you know Jason Kelsey's coming back at center and it seems like Brandon Brooks is safe right now at right guard and maybe is there a deal to be made where they can trade Brandon Brooks to make room for uh, Landon Dickerson. It's possible. The only issue is, and we're going to talk about this a lot in the years to come. He's one of those guys that has so much guaranteed money down, you know, next year, the year after that, if you were to get rid of him this year, that drains into your current salary cap. So it's going to be hard to move him and have the space to take on the money that's going to drain in to this year's cap. So uh, I'm not saying it can't be done. They obviously can move Zach Ertz to clear room. Uh, they can restructure Derek Barnett's contract if they feel comfortable doing that to clear some room to be able to inherit it. But, you know, they may just want Brandon Brooks to stay to continue to develop uh, the quarterback and the offense and and just assume that someone's going to get hurt and Dickerson can get in there. But it will be difficult if no one gets – you don't want Landon Dickerson who's – I think it's fair to say you just – you know, he's got so much toll on his body from the injuries. You don't want to sit there – wasting time on the bench doing nothing if you think he can play right now. So it'll be – this will be one of those discussions I'm sure they have at training camp as to is he back, is he playing at training camp, is he ready to compete, and is he that good that we really do need to make a move to clear a room for him. Yeah, that would be interesting. Like, you know, we we pretty much feel there's going to be a battle for left tackle between Dillard and Mylotta, right? Those two guys will battle there. Do they have a legit battle – for the left guard spot between Dickerson and Sayamala, and then you Sayamala as kind of the swing guy, not swing tackle, guard and center. Yeah, I mean, I don't see that only because they've committed to Sayamala for the long haul. He's a pretty good player. He's still young. I would think it's Brooks that they would have to make the decision on him because of his age and his injury history of whether it's worthwhile holding on to him or just kind of trying to find a taker. Wow. I, I, I feel like, I don't know, maybe I just view Brooks as he is a guy that, 
you feel pretty good about when he's back. I know he's got the injury, but he came back from this injury all, once and was an all-pro coming back from this injury. I know coming back from it twice, but, man, I'm not counting him out the way he looked coming off this injury. And if he's back healthy, he's one of the best in the game. Yeah, but it, it, unfortunately, this is not a, a discussion that re- revolves around talent. It's a, it's about age. It's about injury history and about money, first and foremost, and what he's owed compared to being able to have your nice cost-controlled left guard in Sayamalu and then an even nicer cost-controlled rookie in Dickerson be able to play right guard, and then you move that big contract. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, do, do, do you have to? You do have to wonder. I know he's come back from several injuries and he's reshaped his body, but can he still be their right guard for three more years? I'm talking about Brandon Brooks now. Um, is it worth having that? I, you know, that's a question for Howie and his staff to come up with. I, I think. I think you know this is interesting because if he's on the team, this team and they play. If he's on the roster at the start of the season and he plays, and then the team has success. It's kind of hard to, you know, if he plays really well, it's kind of hard to say, hey, we're going to move on from you because you were a part of the success. We already have you under contract. They have him and Johnson under contract for, I think, two and three more years. Yeah, I don't think that that would be a trade deadline move. I think it would be more of a training camp type move to get, you know, what you can for him at that time. You're right. If you're doing at the deadline, I mean, you could. You could see how the team is doing. And if it's not – Here's what here's what I have trouble like kind of answering questions with because a lot of people are in the this is supposed to be a developmental year anyway. I'm not expecting the Eagles to win the Super Bowl. I'm what I'm just kind of trying to see Jalen Hurts' development. And then yet the same people will be like, What are you doing at cornerback? What do you mean Zach McPherson's gonna be your starter on the outside? He's a fourth round pick, he's not ready. And then I'll go back, but wait, you just said that you said it was a developmental year. So like can you pick a side to Well, I didn't <laughs> say that. <laughs> no, you I'm just saying when that I'm just saying like when you take the temperature of the fan, yeah. they're, they're completely accepting of development on one area, right. but completely intolerant of development in another area. So I don't know how to answer it when people say that. But. Yeah, I, yeah. No, <laughs> and, but I, I think if you've listened to how he, you know, read between the lines a little bit, you know, he, he was on with John Clark on his podcast and said, no, we don't, we're not rebuilding, we're retooling. And, you know, Sal Powell was on two Fridays ago and said the same thing, that, you know, inside that building – He's been told that they think they can win the division this year, that they're closer than people outside the building think, they, which tells me they feel that the injuries were a big reason why this team struggled and, of course, the quarterback play. And guess what? They remedied that. They got rid of the guy. They did get rid of it. Well, now, we have no idea if they upgraded. We just know they got rid of it, and they got rid of the coaching staff, and so there's a lot of newness. I think that that also speaks to the fact that, look, no team has won the division two years in a row since 2003, 2004 Eagles, if I'm not mistaken. So that's going on like 17 years now, which is amazing if you think about it. Um, But yeah, there's no one team in the NFC East that you look at and you go, damn, that's a heck of a team right there. I mean, anybody can win it. I still like Washington. I liked them last year. I I like them again this year because I love the young front seven that they have. Um, and I think they're building the right way for the first time in a long time. Of course, they can always screw it up. But, but yeah, obviously Dallas with Dak coming back is going to be pretty difficult to beat at times too. But no one, no one is unbeatable in that division. So the Eagles shouldn't have to concede anything at this moment. Uh, let me get your opinion. I was having a conversation with somebody about this. This is what I love about post-draft is now you have the guys on the team and you're, you're, you're moving forward. And it's like, all right, how do I fit, picture this guy? Devonta Smith is obviously making the team. That's not a question. Jalen Rager is obviously making the team. After him, is anybody else definitively making the team? Or do you feel that you've got a big battle for three, four, five, and if they keep a six wide receiver? No, that's something Adam and I talked about on the podcast that dropped Monday morning is that there is going to be great competition at wide receiver. You're right. Smith makes a team. Jalen Rager makes the team. As we sit here today, it's hard to see Greg Ward not making the team because of his production and his leadership. And he's probably the elder statesman, as scary as enough to say, of the wide receivers. But let's face it, he's not the most explosive guy and they want to be a more vertical team. And if you have um, if Travis Fulgham kind of comes back better and can play that X, then that's going to move Devontae and Jalen into the slot a little bit more and give you that vertical element. And then Hightower and Watkins can play the Z, the outside Z, because they have speed. They can also play the slot. So uh, do I think that Greg Ward is not going to make the team? No. But do I think he's competing like he should every year because he's that kind of a guy that you're always looking to upgrade over? 
Yeah, I think that's fair to say. So there's a lot of competition that will be after there. I, I think Fulgham's got – Fulgham would have to really – because he's got size, Mike. He's the only one that has, like, decent size. Um, he'd have to really have a bad, bad training camp not to make it. But after that, it's it's a nice little game of who's who. I mean, J.J. Ortega Whiteside, I forgot to mention him too. Yeah. He's got size as well. He's got a new – look, if, if I'm him, I feel like I have a little bit of a reprieve. There's a new staff. It's a new mentality. Uh, it's supposed to be a very wide receiver friendly coaching staff. He is a natural X, which they don't really have with some size. So he'll get an opportunity. The only thing is if he doesn't play well enough to be in your top three, he's not a special teams guy. So he's not going to make the team this year as a not great second round pick. Who's a fringe roster, but I can't see him being the fifth or sixth wide receiver because he's really not a producer on special teams. Yeah. That, that's the, that's the question I guess is at what point now, do you get to the point where I can't just keep you because you were a second-round pick? And quite frankly, John Hightower, Quez Watkins, who were drafted last year, I guess if they're not part of the plans, they're not any, especially Hightower. Watkins uh, didn't, you know, he was inactive a lot last year, but Hightower got a lot of playing time relative to his draft position. I would imagine if this coaching staff says that, you're not, we're not married to you either. Well, yeah, I mean, what the coaching staff saw last year when they evaluated the tape, right, was a guy who showed the ability to get open on specific downfield routes, but only caught about 50% of the balls that were put there for him to catch. So, and uh, maturity issues, as, as many rookies deal with, I mean, it's a tough acclimation and last year was even tougher because of the pandemic, but no excuses year two. You got to have learned that, put it behind you and show that you can be reliable down the field when the quarterback throws you the ball. What's, uh, in your mind, the deal with Ertz? Is he here? Do they just say, you know what? We feel like we're better with him. I mean, Howie made the comment that, hey, he's – or is there a higher possibility that he's gone? No, I still think he's gone. I think this feels like <clears> – <throat> excuse me – how the Carson Wentz situation lingered out and people started to think, well, maybe Carson Wentz isn't going to be traded. And whenever there was a public statement about it, oh, it's – you know, Carson Wentz is our quarterback. You know, he's a big part of our team. He's like – one of our fingers, you know, now you're hearing Zach Ertz and how valuable he is and productive. I, at the end of the day, I don't see him being back with the team. Yeah, I, that I, one's I, interesting. I he wants to be, so. <laughs> well, and that's just, that's another interesting part of this. I mean, because salary-wise, they got themselves under the cap. Do they just feel like, hey, his contract's gone anyway. We might as well just keep him for the last year. Yeah, but they got to pay those rookies. So, uh, you know, I don't know how far under the cap they are, and you always have to make sure you have some money in case you have to sign some players or – trade for a player in, in the middle of camp or season. So, you know, if you're not, if, if Dallas got it, your number one tight end and you're running more of a pure, purer West coast offense, um, and you're, and you're not 12 personnel heavy anymore. And look at all the investment they put in at wide receiver. It would be ridiculous now to, to be a two tight end offense with what they've got. So the, it just doesn't compute. It doesn't match up. I don't see him being on yeah, the team. He, that's interesting. And, and it's, you're, I guess it's interesting. We I think we brushed on this Monday a little bit, but if Ertz is part of a trade for a corner, much like Jordan Matthews was. Yeah, it would have to be Ertz and probably some draft compensation to get a corner, depending on who that cornerback is. If it's a one-year guy, maybe you do a one for like an Ertz for a veteran guy who's got one year left. Darby had two left plus the ability to franchise. So it was almost like three when they traded for him. So the Bills weren't just going to take a, a Jordan Matthews on one year and deal. They got a third. And, 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 yeah, that's what I'm saying. They weren't just going to accept Jordan Matthews out of it. They needed something that was a little bit more worthwhile and valuable to them. All right. Well, I, for one, am looking forward to some of these battles at training camp. I think they have some interesting ones. We just hit on just a few of them. Left tackle, we threw out there. We didn't really break it down much, but left tackle is going to be one. Uh, wide receiver room, very interesting. Uh, I'm interested to see what they do with Gainwell. I guess him in Boston, Scott now. Now, does Boston Scott now have a, a you know a chance to get cut? So that's just on the offensive side of the ball, and I'm sure there's some other things uh, that we're missing. But we got plenty more football at four. The new Inside the Birds podcast drops tomorrow morning at six a.m. Make sure uh, on your way to work you check that out. Inside the Birds six a.m. tomorrow, and then uh, Adam Kaplan is here on tomorrow's edition of Inside the Birds. We'll uh, excuse me, football at four. We'll get his first opinion on this new draft class and some of the things that have come out and uh, since then. Fist pump to you there, Tom Donahue. Boom. <laughs> Who apparently felt the need to say that it wasn't a big deal. Uh, he didn't even know he was on the camera. 
So yeah. I guess the Eagles are in like, all right, we got to do something because Roseman saying it's not a big deal isn't enough. Exactly. Well, and I and I just to add, I was told that, uh, and not by a like a propaganda source at all, but I was told that Tom felt pretty bad about that. I mean, he's ne- most people don't even remember or didn't know that Donahoe was working for the team still until that happened. He's a that. very under the the behind the scenes. He's not about him. It's never been his style, and unfortunately, that happened, and it made it seem the opposite. Yeah, I said that the other day. I said I forgot he was even with the team still. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I said. He's he's kind of been an under the radar guy, so I know he's not happy with with how that got perceived. All right, uh, and by the way, I will uh, bring uh, what I'm talking about up. Uh, there was a tweet out there by an NFL reporter that apparently you know got the news that Tom Donahue said, "Hey, not a big deal. This happens a lot." Mm-hmm. I'll give you more details on that coming up. He's Jeff Mosher, uh, the Inside the Birds podcast, and of course, he like all guests appeared via the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. All right, Mosher, see you, man. All right, my brother. Take care.